Hello everyone, my name is Rose Simpson. I'm a librarian at the New Haven Free Public Library and welcome to the lives of a, fruit, of a food professional. We are here with our creative in residence, Nadine Nelson, who is going to be telling us about all the different ways you can be a food professional. Nadine, can you tell us more about this? Yes, hi, I'm Nadine Nelson. I am the chef, owner, educator, artist, activist of Global Local Gourmet. It is an interactive culinary education company. We specialize in experiential Epicurean events in the forms of cooking classes, um, culinary tours, wellness workshops. We're running a camp this summer at Sticks and Stones Farm in Newtown, Connecticut. And so I have worked just about every aspect of food and hospitality. And so I kind of renamed <clears throat> my presentation, Adventures in Culinary Artistry, Brand and Revenue Growth with Technology, Marketing and Alternative Enterprise. Because um, as a creative, sometimes what I do gets scoffed off as kind of frivolous. And I tell people when you're in business, you're in business to make money. So even though I might be an artist, um, you can go with the philosophy of being a starving artist or being a starting cre starving creative, or you can <clears throat> conduct yourself as a business. And in a business, even if it's a not-for-profit, you're still supposed to make money because if you don't have a profit, then you can't do business. So um, I am unconventional in the way that I have done business. And so this presentation is going to be very kind of unconventional and all over the place because um, Julia Child says not to apologize when serving food if something is not as what you want it to be. And I will just say that the presentation works to put me on path and give you information in a way that is kind of linear, but my mind is not linear. And I um, wish that the pres I had more time to spend on the presentation, just aesthetically and visually. However, it works for what it's supposed to do, which is to keep me on task, talking about the many different things that I have done in food. And that's what this presentation is about, because many people feel that being a chef or being a culinary professional is only about cooking. And um, there's so many different um, careers in food and um, from seed to waste. So I'm only gonna talk about like my little portion of the things that I do as an educator, as I've done as an artist, as I've done as a event um, producer, but I have owned a, a food truck. I have been a catering manager. Um, I've done, a lot of different event um, um, production and curation. I've been a food writer. So I'm gonna discuss a lot of those different things. Um, I have a certificate in um, food styling. So I'm gonna talk about a lot of the things, especially behind the scenes, because in many ways um, I've worked through um, several um, recessions. And it's the reason why is because I have alternative skills and then just cooking food. And I did not start my business um, in regard to just being a chef that you might traditionally or stereotypically just think of as a restaurateur or a caterer or um, for a food truck. So I've never really done that type of cooking full time. And I'll talk a little bit about my story interweave that, but I want to um, get on a little bit with the presentation and move it a little forward. And so we have two clips from two different movies on two different sides of being a chef, which I think is funny. And then I'll talk a little bit about myself and then we can see like, um, what are some of the skills of being a chef and working in a kitchen? And I will you talk about those skills and apply them to how you have a business, how you create a brand, how you create a niche, how you service people. Because when you service people, 
with a need, then you have business. And so um, hopefully you'll see a trend that the way I set up business and I started my business over 15 years ago and I was a dean at a private school. I've always been involved in food from college um, part-time, but when I decided to go full-time, I went and I did a business plan and I cannot express enough how important it is and that anyone who's starting business and even if you don't go forward with the business, it's important that I think everyone should do a business plan because the way that when the different skills and how you have to go through different paradigms of a business plan makes you think about just need and always understanding that if you want to be employable, if you want to have business, like what are the needs that you can serve? And so I did a business plan because I realized I did not want to be just a traditional chef. Um, and with that business plan, I was able to see different alternatives to having a viable business. So we're going to show these clips of traditional chefing because I think that's important because being a chef, that word in French means chief, being a leader and many of the skills, even though I might not use them traditionally in a kitchen every day, I use those skills. And it's important that you see them in different, different ways and different aspects in both fictionally and then, and also a real setting. All right, Rose, I will turn off my camera while we're okay. let us pull up the presentation okay Is rare. Apparently not rare enough. Any rarer to walk out of here and hail a cab. Look, these are ad agency people. They spend a lot of money here. No tantrums tonight. Just fire another one. Uh, All right, one rare steak on the fly. Rare steak on the fly. Where's the lamb for six? Has a crayon. Great, chef. Pick up. Shireen Capaccio. Asshole on seven again. He wants to know whether you've ever seen a rare steak before. Murder <laughs> for you? You out of your mind? Yeah, that's why I'm in therapy. I'm so sorry. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll get you a new tablecloth. Oh no, please let me take care of that. <laughs> So 
just want a steak. <laughs> I wish there was a cookbook for life, you know? With recipes telling us exactly what to do. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Yeah, so um, that clip leads into um, why I do culinary education. And so I saw a need, like, so I started my business um, like around 2005 and um, full time. And <clears throat> Um, I went to school, I went to Tufts University outside of Boston, in Boston, um, and I got my teacher certificate, and I was in education before that. I was in, I specialized in program planning and um, training, and so when I saw that I didn't have to be a restaurant chef, because as you can see, um, I love cooking for people. It's one of the things I love doing. So I do that, you know, I get to the way that I run my business. Um, I get to exercise different aspects of my personality. And so I love to cook for people, but not in a restaurant setting because of some of the things that you just saw there with Catherine Zita Zones um, and No Reservations um, that... I don't have necessarily temperament. I think that maybe when, if I started off when I was younger and I catered when I was younger and I like that kind of control because you know how many people it's gonna be, you're paid beforehand. Having a restaurant is very stressful and cooking for people and their particular whims can be very stressful. And, and then it takes away the love of food. So I didn't, I didn't necessarily want that. And then also the expectation that you cook the same thing every day. That is very, hard to do. It's not something that I, I can do, but it's also, um, I lose interest. And so if I was going to be a certain type of chef, like I'd be a pop-up chef or, you know, like in Japan, you go and, you know, like you go to restaurants and it's like chef's choice, you know, like that's the kind of chef that I am. And so, um, but I did not want to be a restaurant chef. So I saw that I could probably do culinary education. I saw that, you know, like we're looking at niches, like what are things that people will need? And so that's how I built like the classes that I would teach and based on my strengths and my background. And then also based on like necessity, because when you're having a business, like you want to do things that people um, need. Because like when you're in a pandemic in 2008, there was a recession you know, I specialize in plant-based food um, in global ways, like in regard to my cuisine kind of focus and like, like um, special diets. And the reason why I do that is because my background, I grew up Seven Day Adventist and I've talked a lot about that in my the programs here at the library. And Seven Day Adventists are the only group of people in America that are, um, in Loma Linda, California, that have lived over a hundred. And so the reason why they've lived over a hundred is because um, with other people, the blue zones, they, many of them are vegetarian, plant-based or vegan. They have active lifestyle, they're connected to nature. They're very um, connected to their faith and church, which helps with a healthy lifestyle. And so growing up with that, I understood that a lot of people, um, in America partake in the standard American diet, which is sad and um, the acronym, but is not you know, necessarily very um, effective for your health and you know, causes um, uh, morbidities. So um, I saw that there was a need and a service that I had those skills in order to be able that I, people love my food in regard and I, I cook a lot of healthy food. And, and so people enjoy that. And so I saw that with my background, I would be able to do that, you know, as a teacher, as a trained teacher, um, I'm able to 
be not only a translator of culture, but if someone has diabetes, I can show them how they can be able to sustain their sugar by using cinnamon or eating quinoa and making those things in a way that makes them feel satisfied. And, um, and that I, it was very important to me being um, an African-American chef um, and educator that, you know, um, when I had my food truck, um, when I was part owner of the food truck, it was really important that the two other co-owners that brought me in to show them how to cook and menu plan for them that they were um, servicing under-resourced communities. And so they wanted to have food that was healthy. They came from a farming background, just like I um, have, and they wanted to service the community with healthy food. And so even though we could make more money in many ways serving like hot dogs, hamburgers, or you know fried chicken wings, it was really important. And it, that has been my philosophy all throughout cooking that even if I do recreational cooking, I'm still, because I think that everyone should, you know, you should have food for celebration. However, it's still going to be healthy and something that I'm going to be proud of. So those are my, those are my um, motivations. And I think that as whatever you do as a culinary professional, you should have a mission, a vision and things that you think about and that you should be operating out of your strengths. And, you know, like my background, you know, I grew up within a religion where they, the food um, health is very important. And so that was a strength. And also being that I grew up in Toronto, Canada, um, where it's the most multicultural city in the world and being Jamaican, where the motto is out of many one people, I had a very, um, global um, background in regard to cooking and many people in America do not and they want to have people spice up their their food that's one of the reasons why people come to cooking classes and so I'm able to um, serve them in offering a wide range of interesting services so my students or my clients don't only come for one class, they might come for a culinary tour that I'll do now that we're opening up a little bit. Um, but I'm also migrating many of my classes online. And I'll talk about that later, being able to adapt. And so um, I offer different things that when someone takes one class, they can take another one or someone is gonna have me teach their, their child this summer and then they'll realize that on Tuesdays, I also off, I'm offering in, in person classes at Sticks and Stones Farm in Newtown. So that's something that they will also do. All right, next slide. So Global Local Gourmet is a community supported kitchen. We empower people through culinary education, creating interactive programs and events around an appreciation of delicious food and lifestyle. We inspire sustainable, communi sustainable communities through the pursuit of Epicurean pleasure. With our partners, our goal is to show the interconnectedness of our world through food and culture while promoting business practices that respect the environment and each other. So that's my mission statement and it's a mouthful. Um, and this picture is from Arts and Ideas and it's from um, a New Orleans pop-up. They're, they're smaller festivals that they have around in the different neighborhoods. And so this is a cooking tent. This was in partnership with City Seed and also like Elm City Market and um, at the time it was called the Land Trust and also Common Ground because they bought the mobile market. And so I, one of the things I'm known for are these interactive kind of cooking tents. So I don't just teach people where I'm talking and it's kind of boring. Um, hopefully this is not boring. And I wish if anyone, there's someone else on here, if anyone would like to ask me questions or talk, um, you can, and Rose can take you off mute or you can um, put a question in the chat and she will um, ask me and also on Facebook, if you're watching there, she will do the same. And I like when there's like some 
interaction. It makes it much more interesting. So yeah, so I'm known for these interactive tents and coming from an educational background, my educational background is experiential. So what does interactive mean? It means non-passive. It means that you're not expecting me just to talk to you. It means that um, they're sitting down here, but um, and looking at this demo, but we have all different stations around the tent. There's a tent right next door that people can do interactive exercises. There was another area um, that was set up for the land trust that um, kids could make little seedlings and be able to bring them home. Um, and we had like a food scavenger hunt that, you know, all linked everything all together. So those are some of the things that um, I do. And so, so Arts and Ideas um, calls and they hire me and then they say what they want. And then, you know, I'm a very place-based. And so it's like, how could I use the, as many assets that are in an area to showcase um, the assets in an area? So we did stuff with um, the sets and library, with City Seed, with Elm City Market, um, with the, the Land Trust. And so that's working in partnership. And as a food professional, I can be one person or I can work in conjunction with other people where I am producing and then they are, um, City Seed and our partnerships together have provided administrative and operational support that make it good for me as a business person to keep my overhead low, lower. And I help them because they don't necessarily have the capacity to produce a whole event like this because they're producing farmer's markets all across the city and doing other things like running sanctuary kitchen. So um, this is how we work um, and create a win-win situation. So throughout the presentation, I'm in, I'm, I'm trying to impart um, business knowledge that will be helpful, that even as a food professional, whether you're a food stylist um, or like me, I do a bunch of different things. I have a bunch of different revenue streams. A lot of the same things apply, like how can you work in partnership? If you are gonna be, if you are a food stylist, how can you work in partnership with a food photographer? How can you work in partnership with, um, a public relations firm, you know, that specializes in food businesses. So then you can go out and work with chefs that need collateral material, marketing material, and they need someone to help them with props and make things look really nice. And that provides an alternative form of income outside of doing um, food styling just for a magazine because magazines are, are becoming archaic. So you need to be able as a food professional to find ways that you can keep yourself continually in business. All right, next slide, please. So we have lost the means to care for ourselves. We are brainwashed into thinking that food, cooking real food costs too much, is too hard and takes too long. Hence, we rely on inexpensive convenience foods, but these aren't so convenient when we become dependent on hundreds of dollars of medication a month when we can't work because we are sick and fat and sluggish, or when we feel so bad that we can't enjoy life anymore. Convenience is killing us. We need a revolution. Cooking real food is a revolutionary act. Dr. Mark Hyman, New York Times bestselling author, family physician, and international leader in the field of functional medicine. And so that has basically been my premise and like motivation for my business. And whether I work in high income zip codes, um, like Wellesley or Weston or Westport and New Canaan and teach cooking classes, or I write curriculum for City Seed or Cornell Scott Health, um, my mission is the same that I'm trying to get anyone and everyone to cook food for themselves because oftentimes we look at food and food access and um, food insecurity, but then 
the quality of the food that we eat. We look at it as a class issue, but I'll tell you this, having worked in all different communities, that most people like eating healthy food is not a luxury in regard to class because I can't say that I grew up what I would say is numerically wealthy. However, we always had healthy food. And there's a lot of people that are not wealthy that eat healthy food. And there's a lot of people who are wealthy or have money to eat healthy food and don't eat healthy food. And so my mission is to get people to eat food that will let them live longer, healthier, and more fruitful and joyful lives. So this is my central kind of premise. And so regardless of what I'm doing in regard to whether it's art or in regard to a regular cooking class or a wellness workshop, basically I'm trying to teach people how to cook healthy food. Next slide. Please. So cooking with real food is revolutionary act. Food is about nourishment and is fundamental to our existence. As more people do not know how to cook, we have lost the means to care for ourselves. The kitchen is a revolutionary place for people to feel empowered, learn, connect to the environment, share their culture, provide fellowship, build community, and cook up solutions to brainwash thinking that food costs too much, is too hard to grow, takes too long to cook, cuisines of people of color are bad for you. The Mediterranean Mediterranean diet is the only great diet in town. People of color can't liberate themselves and their health because they lack the knowledge and the best one for last about food deserts. I will share concrete examples and methodologies that show how cooking and culinary education can advance the food movement and make it even more delicious, inclusive, equitable, and profitable. Okay. Um, so this is when I didn't have enough time to edit stuff. So tools and tactics of a modern day chef. So in this presentation, because I have, um, it's like one for a farmer, one for a chef. And so either or like in regards to the thinking, because I have done lots of farm training and chef training. And so I'm asked to present and I, present this presentation to chefs and farmers because many chefs and farmers and food professionals don't think of what they do in a business way. And it's really important for them, for you to, for any person to think about what they're doing from a point of business, even if they're not in charge of the business. So you know what's going on in your business, even if you're not in charge of the business, because it should be your business to know what's going on in the business that you're working in, All right? So this is the life of a chef at a Michelin star restaurant in Los Angeles. It's a couple of years old, but I thought it was really, um, um, gave a really nice look at what it's like to work in a high end restaurant. It'll be interesting to see what happens because you see the rise of ghost kitchens now. So ghost kitchens are places where, you know, you get, you order from Uber Eats or um, Dine and Dash, uh, um, DoorDash. Um, and, you know, like there's, there's no seating. You just order off of an app and they make your food and they send it to you. So that is um, one of the places that um, is, there's a place for growth in food because food is in uh, why this presentation is important at this time is, you know, if you're a chef or working in hospitality or at a restaurant, um, you know, it's a tenuous time because with the pandemic and the inability for all of us to, if you had a small restaurant, you know, a small restaurant, restaurants, grocery stores, anything in regard to food, being a farmer, um, is a small, a small mar um, profit margin. So then when you take out seats and then you close down places for periods of time, then your the profit margin is decimated and you have to pay your electricity and then you have to pay your manager and you have to pay your dishwasher, you know, you have to pay your bartender, you know, your, your, your waiter. So all these things. So when you take out seats, then that, diminishes your ability to be able to make income and then 
to be able to make a profit. And so it'll be interesting to see like in uh, fine dining, you know, like in regard to, I'm fascinated by urban planning and the interconnectedness of the city, especially, but you know, the everywhere about that, you know, with, you know, places like New York or Boston, they're Philadelphia that I've, to tra I've had to travel a little bit during the pandemic for work and there are ghost towns. And so all those restaurants that are in the, you know, that service businesses, you know, they're closed down. So now like, you know, my brother works in, in New York as a corporate lawyer and he said that they're not going back to September. So like, what does that mean for the neighborhoods? A lot of places in New York, they converted their um, office buildings into apartment buildings. So maybe that might um, bring back foot traffic to places that were decimated by over a year and a half of office buildings being closed. And so therefore all the things on the lower levels, coffee shops, restaurants, um, places that are just open from seven to three, just being totally, totally closed. So I'm interested to see how, what's gonna happen in food because many sectors in food are not doing, doing that well, All right? So tools and tactics of a modern day chef and look at the video from that point of view. You know what it takes to be a cook in LA? Self-sacrifice. I left Virginia to come to LA because there's a certain energy that translates to the food scene here that I haven't found anywhere else. I work at Melise, which is a two Michelin star French fine dining restaurant in Santa Monica, California, and it's one of the best restaurants in LA. Working on the line in the kitchen is like composing a symphony. <laughs> it really is. It's almost like each dish is like one is the violins, one is the cello, one is the keyboard, and another is the drums. My first job in the kitchen was when I was 16 as a dishwasher, and that was before I even knew I wanted to cook. I was just a kid looking for a job. After I started working there and just seeing something as simple as salads being plated, it like kind of drew me in. Like I was like, this is pretty amazing. As sous chef at Melissa, I have to go to the farmer's market first thing in the morning pick up produce, go back to the restaurant, disperse it to the staff, and then we start prepping. We have to get fish deboned, tomatoes concassate, sauces simmering. All this has to be ready before service at six o'clock. is one of the hardest jobs I've had in my life. You're under this like constant stress and on top of that you're working long hours, you're on your feet all day and it's just completely physically and mentally straining and most people can't handle it. But I love it. There. See how beautiful that looks and we sear it off nicely. It also protects how it is being so delicate. It helps protect the flesh. Chef Josiah Citrin is one of the most renowned and respected chefs in LA. And it was only natural that I wanted to come work for him. He's almost like the epitome of an old school French chef relocated in the US. He has that passion, that drive, and intensity that you come to expect from great chefs like himself. One day I was in the kitchen and I was scrambling eggs. And it, this memory kicked back to me about from my grandmother and how she taught me how to properly scramble eggs when I was a little kid. 
And she was explaining how you use a spoon to stir it and cook it really gently so that the texture comes out nice. And it's actually like a classical French way of cooking. And I have a Southern grandmother, it was kind of weird. And it was like little moments like that that I think back that kind of directed me to cooking that I didn't, didn't really realize until now. If you want to be a chef, you can't wait around for someone to hand it to you. You almost have to take it. Hosting pop-up dinners have given me and my friend Gary a chance to not only showcase our skills, but to do what we're trained to do, be a chef. For the oyster dish, I was thinking, right, um, we have those nice clear bowls. Okay. We'll put the garnish in the middle and then pour the gazpacho so it comes like two thirds of the way up. I brought a fish tank bubbler mm -hmm. and instead of making foam on this, uh, with the frother, let's do bubbles. You know? And we'll just drop that right on exactly. top. I just want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. Um, as you know, we're just cooks when it boils down to it. That's our life. This is what we do. This is what we love to do in our free time. We, we just spent our last few off days preparing this for you and had a lot of fun doing it. So cheers to the night. Thank you, Chef. Thank you, Chef. I always have this sense of satisfaction and almost comfort of knowing that something that I served pleased someone else. And I think that's what most cooks thrive on. You can put it on the next slide. I'm going to read the other slide while the other slide is on. Next one. Yeah. So this is Nina Compton, and she owns a couple of restaurants in New Orleans. And she is from St. Lucia. And she won the highest award that you can win as a chef, James Beard Award. And um, she's a chef that I really look up to. I like her style also of cooking because um, it truly is Creole and represents New Orleans, which is very Caribbean. And I'm Jamaican, so at the top of the hour. And I do cook from all different types of food. Um, however, of course, you're gonna root for your, a woman, a black woman and a person from the Caribbean. And so um, I just wanted to go over like, um, you know, some of the, the attributes and um, skills that you need to be a chef. And, you know, especially if you're going to own a chef business, um, own a restaurant or a food truck, a catering company, meal planning, you know, whatever you have to do, you have to do accounting, you know, um, when you own your own business, like people um, glorify it. And I don't like to poo poo it either, because I don't, you know, when people want to have a business, you, I always want to um, share or, you know, like, give them encouragement, because um, it is a very hard thing. Um, many times you're working by yourself and even when you're working with other people, you know, you're working by, you, you, it's like you're working by yourself. Um, it can feel, it can feel like that. Um, and, um, so, and, and people like things that people associate with working by yourself you're like oh you could do whatever you want oh your time off it's like when you're working for yourself you're working all the time I've been working seven days a week and I'm not complaining um and I'm glad for the work and this is the thing like you know like when you have different skills and when a pandemic happens and I don't have a restaurant however I did have a whole bunch of events that were scheduled because last year my daughter um, is older and I was going to go out and start doing events. So the way that I started my business, I started my business um, as a personal chefing business that I specialized in culinary education. So I did do some personal chefing. And um, so personal chefing and 
So some of, um, some of the, in regards to the presentations going all over the place, which in regard to, I'm telling you my story and so it might not be um, linear. So um, in regard to personal chefing, the reason why I wanted to be a personal chef is that I could go into people's homes and I could cook for them and you don't need a, a catering certificate. And so that made it easier because in regard to Boston, having a catering certificate, you need a kitchen. It's so hard to have a kitchen in a place like Boston or New York. And so when I first started out, you didn't have um, kitchens in which you could, that were so, and, and even now they're not, it's not easy to have access to a catering kitchen. It really isn't because even if you have access to the kitchen, the kitchen might not be the best kitchen in the world. So, um, so it was a way around that. And then also for the, the volume of people that I like to cook for, I don't like to cook for a lot of people. I like to cook between, you know, like to keep it from 24 to a hundred, a sweet spot is maybe 50, but, um, I like to manage that because then I don't have to depend on a lot of other people. And in the restaurant industry, as you can see across the nation, um, they're having hiring issues because um, of different hiring practices that are kind of archaic and that need to be really reconsidered. When I was a waitress over 30 years ago, um, my salary was two dollars and something cents 17 cents i think i used to wait every like three months to um to um cash my checks because my checks were like 24 dollars for the weekend and so um you know like we really need to look at that how we pay you know um dishwashers how we pay bus people how we pay chefs how we pay because some people get tipped out you know, where you can, you know, before the pandemic, certain, if you were an executive chef at a place like the Four Seasons, um, a high-end, you know, hotel, and I say hotel because they have the money for benefits and all that kind of stuff um, in regard to, that's like the creme de la creme, like in regard to benefits. It might not be what you want to do as a, as a chef because you might not have as much creativity, but in regard to job security and making a lot of money, um, I assume that people are gonna be watching this in regard to money, I would be. And so I'm not going to be, if people wanna ask me questions about money, you can, because I feel like in America, we don't talk about these things. And that's why labor issues, that's why we are in the situation that we are in where people are groveling for $15 when that's not a living wage. So um, in regard to being an executive chef, like in a place like the Four Seasons or a restaurant group, you know, you can make 90 to a hundred and something thousand dollars with um, a percentage of um, the, the profits, you know, and then have a good um, your benefit package, you know, because your benefits in regard to having dental and medical and time off and, you know, professional development, that, that, that is something that you should want in. And so that comes to like where my background being an educator, I was always an educator administrator. I had my summers off. So it's like going and having my own business, like where you have no days off. It's um, quite interesting. And so I'm just, if you're gonna work for an establishment as a chef, these are some of the things that you might want to consider and um, negotiate. Um, so being a head chef, um, you know, especially, you know, things budgeting, you know, um, you know, you're in charge of the whole kitchen. And so the kitchen is, you know, divided up into different stations. And so you might do, I love Gar Manger. Gar Manger is the salad station or d'oeuvres, um, sausages, like vinaigrettes and sauces, stuff like that. So it's like kind of like making food pretty because you also do, you know, do you do the garnishes and stuff like that. And I like that kind of stuff. I like making condiments. That's, um, what you do in Garmanger, but then you know you have uh, you might have in a restaurant a fry station you might have a meat station depending on what quality of restaurant is if it's high end you know you might have a meat station you know um and 
dessert station and people a sauce station different stations like that it's like the french system or you know like if you're just a casual restaurant you might have like a salad station a fry station and people um take care of the grill you know um it's like that and so um in regard to being a chef i love cooking for people but the idea of standing up on my feet for 12 hours and only getting between 11 and 15 17 dollars an hour um that's why I never went into chefing because when I, I went to Camden Hall and a um, college preparatory school. So when I was going to school, you didn't think about going to um, chef school. Like if you want, you know, you didn't think about that, you know, um, now, you know, you think about the CIA and they have business programs and they have different aspects of hospitality and all of that. But, you know, when I was going to school, you only thought about being a restaurant chef or kind of a catering chef. And so those are two things, I, I, as I said at the top of the hour, that my skill set, I did not want to be able to do. So I'm looking at this um, list of different skills. So it's like communication, catering, commitment to quality, consistency, um, control labor costs, first aid, flexibility, food preparation, menu planning, marketing, measurements, interpersonal skills. That's very important, interpersonal skills. Because many chefs, like one of the reasons why people want, don't want to talk about not, not only the low wage in the kitchen, but the atmosphere that one creates in the kitchen. So I, in my personal chefing, I, I thought about like when I first started in doing this business plan, like what were ways in which to make money. And so I looked at in regard to Boston, where I was living at the time, which were the high money districts, um, zip codes, because I wanted to create a business where people had disposable income. So if there was, uh, and I wasn't trying to be fatalistic, but these are things that you might want to think about, you know, in regard to one year plan, five year plan, 10 year plan, you know, like, you know, we go through cycles through the economy. And so I want to create a business where, you know, it was out of necessity. And so a lot of people who did cooking classes just based on a particular culture um, or they marketed for um, just recreation, like when the 2008 um, recession happened, they were not able to sustain themselves. But because I was already doing, I saw that vegan, vegetarian, like when I did a class like that in Boston, I do a class vegan gourmet. So it's just seasonal, so it can change all year round, but it always sells out, you know? And I do more plant-based and the cultures that are more plant-based. And so, and then also about budgeting. And so, when the 2008 um, recession came, my classes were fine and they were full because I was providing something that people needed. People couldn't eat out again and the same thing during the pandemic. So like for me, like what I do, um, um, there, there, there has been a need. You know, so I write curriculum, I was a teacher, I train people, so, program planning and training, like train the trainer and then curriculum planning. Those are the things that I do kind of behind the scenes that I can always kind of get paid for. So I am now working with a nonprofit in Kansas City and also one in um, Woodbridge, Connecticut. And they are cost sharing like writing a curriculum or program that they'll both share. So because I have that background, I can stay employed, but also because I'm able to negotiate deals where other people will be like, oh, I don't have this money. Well, would, do you, have you thought about working with this nonprofit, which who would also like my services and then licensing out my curriculum? Because I'm not selling it outright unless they want to give big bucks for those things. So negotiation these skills that you need, presentation, problem solving, um, food safety handling, you know, like you have to be able to do that. A sense of humor, social media, the ability to team build, to be a team player, to um, train people, multitasking. So um, these are all these different skills that are in a chef 
a flute professional and I didn't even read all of them because I don't want to um, be that boring, but, you know, knife skills, ordering, um, budgeting, you know, being able to impart passion, all those different things. There's so many different skills that we kind of take for granted and that that's, we're paying people $11 an hour and they have, you're supposed to do all those things and handle the knife and, and fire too. Okay, next slide, please. So this is a farmer one. And so I did the one that before the list based on this and many farmers, just like many chefs, like they're not on Instagram. They don't have a website. Um, and these are things that, you know, like we don't think about farmers that, you know, they, have, they, they need to know ancient farming methods, have business acumen, ability to diversify because they only have one revenue stream. If they're only growing soybeans, if they're only growing one thing, that is a recipe for disaster because what if there's a plate? What if there is um, a, a disease? You know, you know, the ability to be marketing savvy, um, agritourism, understanding that your farm, you can make more money doing a farm tour or you can make more money also making a value-added product. So turning your apples into a chutney. So that all, these are things that, you know, like I've made value-added products. And so um, a value-added product is taking a raw ingredient and making it into something. And um, just like accessories, um, a value-added product a farmer, a milk farmer, which is like milk farmers are in crisis because most people are not, so many people are not drinking milk. They're drinking oat milk or um, almond milk or um, soy milk, some other alternative milk because so many people are, are lactose intolerant or it causes inflammation for many people. So what can you do as a milk farmer? You know, you can make cheese, you can make ice cream, you can make yogurt. Um, so, you know, that milk, that is $3.99 a gallon, then becomes $24.99 a pound when you convert it into a high-end cheese. So you have like Jasper Hill cheese in Vermont, in which I've studied farming at Sterling College. And I was lucky enough to go see their, um, their cheese cave, which is like going into, breaking into the CIA. Um, you have to go in, you have to write, you have to put, all this stuff on so you don't contaminate their cheese because their cheese is so expensive. And so they produce Cabot, um, the Cabot's nicest cloth bound cheddar. They produce it, Jasper Hill cheese. And Jasper Hill cheese is often the cheese that's represented for America when you have to bring a cheese to, um, for like a state dinner or something like that. And um, so, that's just an example about how, in regard to being a food professional, what are the things that you should learn how to do? How to be able to make, maximize how much money you can make from whatever you are making. Um, so these are all the kind of skills that, you know, it's not just about, okay, well, I make a really good thing. Um, you can make that good thing, but if you don't get on Instagram or know how to be able to use SMS marketing, which is like being able to text marketing and all that kind of stuff, or you know, have a newsletter or know how to be able to delegate to someone to be able to do that and be able to ha find it at a low cost, then you're probably not gonna be able to stay in business. Next slide, please. So whether it's farm goals or chef goals, you know, is this gonna be, you know, your, uh, in regards to being a food professional, is this gonna be your hobby or your lifestyle? Or is this gonna, you know, be something that you're doing full time? And, you know, you need, you need to depend on this to pay your, your, you know, your child's school fee and your insurance and your mortgage and your car note. Um, so it takes a different kind of tenacity and problem solving and looking at, how you can create different multiple streams of incomes. And so you have to look at not only your farm resources, but what are the resources that you have within yourself, within your, you know, at your accessibility. So, you know, I might not have my own kitchen, but I um, got the 
City Seed Kitchen, for instance, by using marketing. And my friend from high school worked at Ikea and said, oh, you're doing some really good work with City Seed. Oh, we want to get, you know, give them a kitchen, you know? And so that's using, you know, marketing and your savvy to, I might not be able to have access to something, but um, for my personal self, but I'll be able to have access through my affiliation through um, City Seed. So that's, that's one of the things that, you know, like what are you able, what are the resources, what are the assets that that you have? Um, you know, how much money do you have access to? What are your skills? What skills do you need to improve? You know, do you need to take a class from the library or from SCORE or from Collab? Um, um, to build up your skills so you can solidify your foundation and starting your business or whatever your endeavor um, successfully. And, you know, what kind of enterprise do you want to be able or enterprises? Because I have multiple different things that I'll do um, that I do that I'll, I'll talk about a little later. Next slide. Well, I guess I'm going to talk about it right now. So what is a brand? So a brand is not the mark or logo, the product, the service, the company. A brand is a set of attributes that exist in the heart and mind of the consumer. And so I think that I asked uh, like maybe six weeks ago, what do people think about me and my business? And they thought of me and my business as, you know, like creative. That was like a big word. I did a word cloud. I should put it in. I should have put it in here actually. And they thought of me as an educator and they thought of me as I think like a person to bring people together and um, a connector, you know, and that's definitely what my, my business is. So there's Global Local Gourmet um, under the umbrella of the cooking classes for the adults, it's Kitchen Oasis. And then for the kids, it's Kids Kitchen Oasis. And we kind of, in all areas, kind of specialize in interdisciplinary approach to teaching cooking. So it's not straight ahead just doing demos or a cooking class. And I'll show you a little bit later. And like the interactive cooking tent is um, kind of an example of that. Oh, thank you, Miss Williams. Um, so stir the pot is my, um, civic endeavor, one of my civic endeavors. And that came out of my work with the, um, being chair of the New Haven Food Policy Council and my idea of, um, cooking and food education group of a interactive and fun meeting where we learn and, um, from each other is, um, where we come together at the beginning of the meeting, cook. So we break down barriers and learn from each other, listen to a speaker around food, around New Haven. So it could be a restaurateur, it could be someone talking about school lunch, it could be a farmer. Um, and then, um, and it's also a potluck. So um, before the pandemic, um, bringing food together, um, eating, making food together, and then also, um, usually reading something about a particular food topic and then um, talking and discussing it. And then the whole idea about Stir the Pot is to have people be motivated to participate in a food issue or any issue that they care about around the realm of influence. So it might be, you know, like we've had people run for alder person in New Haven or start a, a, um, a garden or do something around school lunch. Um, so the whole idea is to bring people together around food, around political issues in a non-political way to encourage people to get involved in their local politics, um, city politics, regional, or um, a nonprofit, any type of organization that needs help if they have a talent and an interest. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, 
So what is a brand identity, who you really are, um, how you are perceived, and um, that is what your brand is. So many owners and chefs think a brand is the name of the restaurant logo and a couple of business cards. A true brand impacts every single interaction that your client has um, from your website to the conversation that you might have with me. So this is my promo video from two years ago and I'm gonna update it this month. Thank you. So um, in that video, like my business is called Global Local Gourmet. And so I deal with local businesses and not only just farmers or seasonal businesses like that, because I believe that local um, is also, you might not, your local bakery might not get their grain um, from a hundred miles away, even though we have a bakery, Atticus Bakery that does that and they grind their, um, um, the grains themselves and all that kind of stuff. It's still patroning businesses that are not a chain is really important and interacting with them and showcasing them is really important to me. Um, so not, you know, ethnic um, markets, they might not be quote unquote have local ingredients, but um, those markets are really important for um, to, um, for creating um, uniqueness to neighborhoods and to communities. And it's really important that we patron them, even though we can buy things on Amazon or you know it might be cheaper um, at Walmart. And in a lot of ways, um, ethnic markets at least they're not. Um, it's really important. For me, as I grew up in Toronto and lived in different neighborhoods and lived in places like Boston that has wonderful different enclaves, I started doing culinary tours after teaching particular classes like Brazilian cooking because I saw other cooking teachers weren't teaching that and Boston has a big Brazilian um, population and I didn't necessarily think that Brazilians would take my cooking class, but I thought people who loved Brazilian food would take my cooking class. And that was the case. The same thing like with Vietnamese cuisine. But when you do cu cuisines like that, even when I do Jamaican cuisine or Caribbean cuisine, people still don't know like how to get those ingredients. And so people are like, oh, where do you get those ingredients? So I started doing culinary tours. And so um, to different neighborhoods in different markets. And from those culinary tours, for instance, I work with a particular market that I've been working with for over 10 years, Tropical Market um, in Boston. So from doing those culinary tours and um, the owner seeing that all these people, they would come and they would buy food on the tour, but then they would come back again. We start, I started doing marketing for them. And so these are ways in which you can expand your business based on things that people ask for and your, the talents and the interests that you have. I love markets. Anytime I go to um, other countries or 
other cities. I always go to lo local markets because it says a lot about the regional nature of a place and you get to know a lot. So, you know, in regard to my marketing promo, I wanted to give the idea, I do a lot of different things. And so I'm in the middle of actually refining and niching down a little bit. Um, how, because I do think that it's important not to be a generalist. I would say that I am good at many things and better at being, I'm like, I'm best at being an educator and the things that go in education. I'm very good at being a chef educator. And in regards to being a chef, like I'm really good at producing events, curating events and bringing people together and brands together and showcasing brands and things in different ways and experiential ways. And then um, my, my new talent is art and bringing and doing food art, but then also expanding the notion of food art because food art is, um, it's very temporary. You eat it, it goes away. And so I wanted, I want people to see my art and to take my art seriously, not like they don't take my food seriously, but to, you have to have art that stays around for it to be taken seriously, you know? But I am being better at being a documentor. So I've taught myself how to um, food photography because in my writing, that helps in my writing. And so I went to Tufts for writing and um, not only did I get my teacher certificate, but I got my, my bachelor's in literature. And so that I write food right. And so I got my first um, cover for Yankee Magazine this year. And I write in regard to, um, I'm gonna go through it fast, Rose. Um, I write in regard to my curriculum. I also write in regard to social media. Um, I write recipe right. So I'm trying to show people the different ways in which you can, based on your skills, um, be able to create streams of income for yourself. Uh, Nadine, we've got a question in the Q&A. I wonder what challenges have been huge during this pandemic with the culture of food being based in community building that was snatched for, from us with social distance? Um, well, uh, this residency has been really good at, I have to say that I was apprehensive because I'm an in-person person. And I like to, I'm more like face-to-face, one-on-one. That's how I create community. And even when I do social, social sculpture, art interventions, and I set up things where I create larger environments, how I lead them is more, it's creating intimate moments. So I was really apprehensive about how do you do that? over um, the video. And um, I think that I've worked with different um, formats. And I think that you can create, um, you can create community and especially over, especially over food. I love doing cooking classes or art um, uh, over um, Zoom. Oh, thank you. Uh, um, but, um, you know, work, not so much, but like, you know, having art dates and creating um, different type of configurations in my, um, like we had a pie event, piece to pie event, and it was really great. And it was um, making pie and storytelling. And then people got to break up into different rooms and to be able to talk to each other and, you know, like mixing it up. So, you know, it's not as ideal as being in person, of course, but I do think that you can create intimate moments. I don't think that, you know, everyone's saying that, you know, when we get back to normal, when we get back to normal, I don't think that for a lot of people, you know, they're not going to rush out and all of a sudden be raving and want to go to a concert, you know? So I think that there is a place for these virtual programs. Um, and I know that I am not going to wait for another pandemic to like, I am migrating a lot of my curriculum and programs online so people can just buy the content that I've already created 
And it's not dependent on me having to travel to be able to teach it. And I love actually, you know, doing, I've done more presentations than I would normally because I can't get out to Utah um, easily because I have a child that I have to um, also tend to. So um, I look at things in regard to business, like where can I serve a need and what can I do with the resources I have? It's like, we're in a pandemic. So I couldn't be like, okay, I have to wait, I have to wait, I have to wait because I was looking at Asia and Europe. And so I know, and I know like we could fall back, who knows, because some of these other places have fallen back. And so you, it's like, yes, I am preparing to do in-person events. Um, I have my first um, one in Long Island City for Flux Factory, which is a gallery and, um, it's going to be outside in a garden and it's called Harvest Mandalas. And it's um, something that I'm known for and I, I love doing it and I look forward to doing it. It's really um, amenable to being social distance. Um, so I am planning to do things in person, but I also am planning to do things virtually also. Indefinitely too. Next slide. So why build a brand? You can go next slide. Brand is really important to sales. If you don't have a clear brand, your revenue numbers suffer. You're not going to be able to justify higher prices if people don't understand what your brand represents. In other words, through a clear food business brand, your online, um, the values of your establishment, fresh, clean, sustainable, personable, Whatever these values are, you define them. This all allows you to make arguments like my service is worth a higher price because of without a brand, you have no evidence of your worth and benefit to your customers. And so I don't know if my name, Global Local Gourmet, like I wanted gourmet because obviously gourmet denotes some um, level of excellence in food and level of interest. But then also like the way that I try and convey my brand is like customized and also that you're dealing with an expert that I am a food expert and a food education expert. And so um, I'm just not a chef that's teaching cooking. So like my, like the being a teacher is first and foremost foremost and that not every chef can teach someone how to cook because not everyone can be a teacher although a lot of people think they can be not everyone can be a teacher or be a good one at that right so a strong brand is consistent compelling and clear none of what the slide is and I apologize because I was cutting and pasting and the way that I was doing it because I had to do it really fast it made the my pictures not clear but I'll read them to you and to build a brand blueprint, you know, your story, who are you? So like, I've told you that I'm from Toronto, that, you know, that global aspect, you know, being Jamaican and out of many one people, um, um, I haven't talked about like, you know, like where I've grown up and all that kind of stuff a little bit. Um, and I've told you about the why. Um, I haven't really said really about my niche because I'm really, trying to put the niche in a language, but I'll just say this, that I do experiential learning, but it is around cooking for longevity and not only looking at the way that people eat, but the way that people live to bring people together and enhance our lives and make them more joyful. So I feel that like that's pretty tight, but I don't know if that has that much meaning to people and I'm doing ISA. so. What is your ideal client interviews as I'm re brand, not, I don't know, rebranding, but we like just creating sharper and more effective messaging for my brand. So, and I'm doing that. I've been cleaning up. I had a website that had everything. So like my cooking, my art, um, all the things I do. And so I've separated. So now I have a stir the pot website. So that's just on stir the pot and it's civic endeavors. I have an art website that is in the process of being finished. I have my global local gourmet website. 
And then I have my camp and kitchen oasis website. So people, it's it's easier for people to understand, even though it might it it's um it seems kind of disparate for me. I have those some of them are the same customers, but in regard to art, for instance, when people are coming to my global local gourmet page and they see art, they're like, what is this? You know? So even though it's an experiential event, I can't hit them over the head, my regular house customer, as I would a uh, community um, an organization or someone who's coming specifically for my art. Next. Next slide. Okay, so I've come, I've, I've talked about a little bit about um, what makes me special is that I am a trained educator, but then I also, as a chef, I bring, I think, a lot of chefs are artistic. Some people would say more craft than art, but who knows? But, you know, I bring an artistic element and I bring an experiential element. And so you're always going to be engaged. And I think that by being engaged, you have a good time and it is an experience that a lot of people want to return to and they tell people about. Next slide. So I just basically said that and we're going to skip those slides. Um, the storytelling tool, because I've tried to do a little bit of storytelling. All right, let's go to social sculpture. So these are different aspects of this is like what makes me special. All right, so I'm starting off with this and then we're gonna go to um, like different, um, different careers in food, you know? So social sculpture, schools, faith communities, hospitals and organizations can be instrumental in growing fresh food and educating people about sustainable food, Bryant Terry. So Bryant Terry is a well-known, vegan African-American chef. He just got his own publishing um, print company, uh, which is amazing. Congratulations. And um, he mixes food and art. Um, he curates um, food related art programs for the um, um, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And he's been doing that for two years. And um, so my social sculpture, these are two pictures. The one on top is at Yale and it is a uh, activation that I do called Public Kitchen that started in Boston, Massachusetts. And then the second picture is in Fairhaven um, and is part of Arts and Ideas, um, their pop-ups there. And it's, uh, Another exercise that I do called what's on your plate where people draw what they eat and then that becomes a means by we're drawing to talk about healthy food. So it's not, I don't want to lecture people about healthy food. And then we don't say like, well, this is healthy food. We talk about like, we, there's questions like um, that allow people to come to their own understanding um, for themselves. And so, especially when we do this with adults, it's like, you know, oh, what do you like about what you eat? What would you like to change about what you like to eat? What would you like to learn more about eating? And so then that can lead people to create their own meeting without having judgment about people, but about how people eat, because I try and do things that is culturally relevant, culturally competent and culturally humble. And so the last one, culturally humble, means that I'm always learning from other people, you know, um, constant state of learning and understanding that I can learn. But then also I want to be culturally competent to affirm people and their culture because a lot of people 
um, feel that, you know, oh, I don't want to eat a particular thing from their culture. I don't want to make people feel that. It's like, oh, what, what are ways in which we can, you know, make what you're eating, you know, you can eat this on a special occasion, but how can you make this more helpful so you can eat this more often? And so like, you know, we go through kind of a problem solving kind of situation. And so it becomes, I work with dietitians and nutritionists to show them how to do that. So that's where I do more of the train the trainer, where I create different workshops, where I show people how to be able to do that. Um, Cause I don't have the facility to be able to do those things anymore. And because I train teachers and executives and um, other people, it allows me to be able to show people how to be, do that with their, their clients. And so social sculpture is a term promoted by the German artist, Joseph Ries through a series of very public lecture tours beginning in the early 1970s. It named a kind of artwork that takes place in social realm, an art that requires social engagement, the participation of its audience for its completion. For Buis, the concept was infused with both political intention and spiritual values as spectators being become participants, he believed the catalyst of social sculpture would lead to a transformation of society through the release of popular creativity. Ultimately, the success of social sculpture on the pairing of trust and understanding, a community, community's trust of the artist or collaborative and the artist's understanding of the needs of the community. And so I always say that the things that I do, regardless of like when CDC, hires me to do a curriculum that it's it's place-based and so I talk to the people of the community that they're going to serve and make sure that I have the trust of the people um, to create something that they're going to want and that they can see themselves reflected in themselves and the same thing when I set up these type of exercises I try and create that kind of trust and that social engagement that creates joy that creates learning, that creates understanding, empathy, compassion. Those are like some of my overarching themes. Abundance. Next slide, please. An art intervention. By definition, an art intervention is the interaction with a previously existing artwork, audience, or space. In recent years, this form of conceptual and performance art has become particularly popular, have I need to edit this, inherent playfulness about them as they encourage viewers of, or the audience to interact with the work and with those around them experiencing the intervention. These art in installations and experiential learning happenings alter their physical environment and make people see things in a new way. And so this is um, in Fairhaven at the pop-up tent. And this is, um, it's kind of like I set up like a gallery it's like a food museum, like a mini food museum. And so you can make a food journal. Um, there is a really great exhibit that is online, but they send you pictures that you can use um, and to facilitate conversation called the lexicon of sustainability. So I'm not only trying to feed people nourishment, but like for to teach people about the environment, but like, should I compost? Like, why is that important? And so the lexicon of sustainability is all around for people to engage in. And then also there's information from the different food organizations. So people can find out how do you grow a garden and um, where's the farmer's market? Oh, do you know that if you're on EBT that it's double, it's bounty bucks. So I create those environments for those kind of conversations to be able to happen. Regenerative placemaking. So regenerative design is a system-based approach which advocates developing place-based strategies with a focus on enhancing fruitful relationships between the key principles and needs of ecosystems and society within their global context. In particular, it aims to enhance the regeneration of resources in society and improve quality of life through reconceptualization, our role with ecosystems and resource cycles. Regenerative design introduces the ecological design at least two additional streams, the science or art of place and the science of living systems. Regeneration is far more than simple renewal or restoration. Definitions of the word regenerate include three 
concepts. A radical change for the better, creation of a new spirit, returning energy to the source. I am so sorry. Um, Placemaking capitalizes on a local community's assets, inspiration, and potential with the intention of creating public spaces that promote people's health, ha happiness, and well being. So, those are some of the different kind of art. Regeneration is also, I'm using regenerative placemaking as a concept, but regeneration is a concept within farming and gardening, also known as permaculture, kind of synonymous. Um, placemaking is, some people look at it as a good thing, some people look at it as a bad thing because they, a lot of people can look at it as, I'm gonna just look at, I'm just gonna say the good thing. So this is the two pictures are at art space. This was an activation where it's called Vagaries of the Common. And so I do a lot of things about the common and public and because a lot of um, the people that I really respect, like um, the Black Panthers, they started the free breakfast program, you know, open to the public. A lot of the programs that we have start with the Black, uh, the Black Panthers that they just started themselves and just service the public. And I love that aspect. The Frederick Law Olmsted, um, um, father of American landscape, his whole idea that the park should be open to everyone. And so I practice radical hospitality. And so, you know, if you come to my event and you don't have money, like it's, it's like, I'm not gonna turn you down per se. It's like, you know, who listens to this? We don't know. So uh, it'll be interesting. It's like, well, do you know that Nadine doesn't turn down people? If, but I, I, I don't know if I would, you know, like in, regard, in the sense of the way that I, was, that I was raised. So radical hospitality comes from the uh, Christian religion kind of term. And I, you know, most, a lot, many Christians, um, I don't practice it in that way, but I, I'm just giving context. Many Christians don't practice radical hospitality. That's what, you know, Jesus practiced, like, you know, like feeding anyone and making people, regardless of who they are, feel comfortable. Um, and so that's what I try and practice. And so the whole idea that um, I started cooking from being a resident director at Tufts of a special interest house of so the African-American house. And so I had, um, I was manager of, I was manager of the African-American house. And so I had control with the other fellow manager of the kitchen. So I love to cook. And so of course, you know, you know, understand that you, when you cook for a lot of people, cause I come up from a big family. So that is something that my family um, sent me off with is that, I started cooking and then people started saying like, oh, you cook really well, would you do a reception? So that's how I started catering. You know, I knew I didn't wanna do catering full time, but that's how I started being in the food business and then things morphed into um, other things. And so um, Art Space, Vagaries of the Common, they hired me to work with uh, food waste artists, um, they deal with like compost and they went around um, with this compost mobile getting free food that I coordinated with them to get from um, places like Elm City Market, um, City Seed Farmers Market, different farmers and restaurants that I am connected with. And they brought the food and then I made it into something else. So that's like an example of regenerative placemaking where it's like, you're just, you know, I try, especially if I'm doing things for the common and it's for people that's free that to use things that are in abundance. Next slide. Uh, just a time check. We've got half an hour. Oh, I know. I'm going to go through. I, I, I'm going to go through. Okay. Just yes, making yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I know. Um, so as an educator, um, as a teacher, a culinary educator, um, but coming from an educational role, I'm trying to 
look at all these deeper levels. And that's why people come to my programs and my classes. And then I just want to show you um, this last video um, about like kind of my methodology and how it works. I curated these whole series, these 10 days of events. We're asking people to imagine if people had access to a shared kitchen, a public kitchen, cooking together, learning about food together, sharing recipes together, how having something like that in your neighborhood might change your life. Um, my name's Kenneth Bailey. I'm one of the founders of the Design Studio for Social Intervention. We're a creativity lab for the social justice sector, and we're incredibly invested in reimagining the contemporary public. We were really interested in um, public infrastructure and the public kitchen was our attempt at introducing a new kind of public infrastructure. So like libraries or public schools or, or buses, we said what if um, we had kitchens that were public um, that people could use collectively, it's similar to a library, how might that change social life? So we did a 10-day installation in Upham's Corner that explored that. The hub is the, was the central locus of Public Kitchen, right in the heart of Upham's Corner, um, next to the Strand Theater. And that's where we had an open space that was open four hours a day. You could drop in, have tea, connect with other people who found this, this idea of Public Kitchen interesting, and, and keep in touch. For me, the hub was the best part by far, and I'm a huge fan of the public kitchen because I think it really transforms the space. And I think especially in Upham's Corner, which is a really interesting, amazing place to have it, um, it really gave us an opportunity to interact with people. And Upham's Corner is one of those places where there's not a lot of public space. So the public kitchen functioned in a variety of ways. We had a mobile public kitchen that actually went around the neighborhood. We had a chef that did um, cooking demos at community events in the neighborhood. And then we had events that happened at other parts of, of the neighborhood of Upham's Corner. Part of our mission is to make people imagine what they wouldn't have imagined otherwise. And so publication is an imagination project. We're asking people to imagine an infrastructure that doesn't exist and how that infrastructure, if it did exist, would benefit them. What would you like to see in a public kitchen, or what is important to see in a public kitchen? Uh, a social system, a system of way everybody can network. I, I love canning with people. Uh, one of my favorite moments this summer was doing a canning workshop here at the Food Project and the neighbors, and it was a lot of fun, and I think that would be something I would really love to do with people. Cool. One, of the, one of the things that people talked about was being able to actually have a commercial kitchen space, an actual venue where people get to experience cutting and making the food. I think it's I would want to learn from other people because that's the thing. Like it's 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 a little voyeuristic. I'm always wondering what's happening in someone's kitchen or like what that smell is that I'm smelling. Um, especially my neighbor. I think I'm just gonna actually knock on their door. They're always making something good. <laughs> there is a real desire across um, walks of life to connect around food. Just the, the, uh, the range of people that came together around issues of food um, for, for the variety of different reasons that they did were incredible. And, um, and, and there's a lot of power there. Like there's a lot of untapped potential to really change our relationship to food and to change our relationship to the public and to change our relationship to each other through these kinds of um, gestures, these kinds of endeavors, like a PK, like a public kitchen. All right, so this is Harvest Mandala. So as an artist, I know a lot of people probably ask like, how do I get paid? So this is, an, this is by Artspace commissioned me to do this. And so this is at the Ely House. Um, and so, um, as you can see, like through the other video, I like to set up these different rooms. People like that experiential nature because a lot of people have events that are just passive. So, you know, I, that's what I, that's what I've specialized in as a teacher, making a classroom non-passive and as 
a chef, like making my experiences non-passive. Even if I have a pop-up dinner, there's something going on. There's a ritual. I'm reading cards. I'm doing something. All right, next. And the Harvest Mandalas um, has to do with food, food waste. If you would like to come and see, see it in person, and I might do it for the end here. I'm not sure. I'm deciding between now and Friday, but it will be happening in at the end of the month at um, during Memorial Day in Flux Factory in Long Island City. So Master Cooks Corps, um, this is taking my experience from my train the trainer. And so um, I get paid by nonprofits, Yale, health, like stuff like that to train people how to go out and be better educators, um, community educators, peer educators um, for healthy food. So I created a program of what I would have wanted, like when I was going out to teach food, like how I was, I was a trained teacher. So what that would look like for a, a chef. So, and so that is a program that I just got a grant from New England um, Environmental Fund. Um, it's been funded through the health department and um, is Mazzaro Farm and a set of organizations in the Valley in Connecticut are looking for me to do a training. So those are the things that are saying about looking at areas I like special diets. Some people don't, you know, I like special diets because I grew up around people who were vegan and vegetarian and they made food delicious. And I like that challenge to make people. Um, and, and it's something that, you know, baby boomers, you know, like if you're a chef now and you are unemployed, you might think about doing meal preparation or, you know, specializing and teaching people how to eat better if they're on diabetes and stuff like that. Cause that's something that is not going to go away. Next slide. So I was just saying about finding your niche, you know, find your niche, you know, um, and then next slide, who are your customers? So I always call my customers the white hairs. They have white hair, they're baby boomers, usually 45 to 65, disposable income, um, usually um, highly educated um, and come with a different kind of features of a person who's high, highly educated, travels, likes wine, so forth and so on. So next. So I was just saying gender, they're mostly women. Um, I just talked about their interest, their location, high money zip codes. That's where I've targeted um, any ethnicity, any religion per se, income, high income, because you have to have disposable income to do a lot of things that I'm doing. Um, next slide. You know, where do I, how do I provide a customer, you know, solve a customer problem or need? Um, and where I found my niche is healthy food in a global way, because then it gives people a lot of alternatives and a lot of ways in which I'll, diets from different countries or um, different types of people, be it the blue zones, um, those make it amenable for their healthy um, and um, adapt to special diets. But these are different in regard to being a food press professional. These are um, different problems and needs that you can deliver on. Next slide, please. And this is a, uh, a slide that goes into detail about different ways, segmentation of meeting customers' needs. So you see a lot of people doing meal prep, you know, doing meal prep where you have people who are doing keto and people who are, um, they want smoothies, but they don't want to do all that work, you know? So people just chop up all the fruit and everything and put them in bags. So people just have to put them in a the blender, you know? So there's many ways in which you can make money as a food professional. You just have to figure out what do you want to do? What are your talents? Um, what do people need? Next slide. Look at trends. 
So 56 respondents um, say they want food to be kept in the community, then you might want to work with local vendors as I do. So I like to work with farmers and artisans because I like those things and I like to promote those things because they usually don't have the marketing dollars set aside for publicity. And so that's a way where we can both mutually help each other. Next slide. Define your niche. Your business is the best place for with specific need because of So 85% of new products and services fail because people don't know what their customers need. So it's really important to do market research and do your own, um, your own interviews, um, either individually or groups of people based on your customers. Cooking is an art and patience a virtue. Careful shopping, fresh ingredients, and an unharried approach are nearly all that you need. There is one more thing, love. Love for food and love for those you invite to your table. With a combination of these things, you can be an artist, not perhaps in the representational style of Dutch master, but rather like Gauguin, the naive, or Van Gogh, the impressionist. Plates or pictures of sunshine, tastes of happiness and love, Keith Floyd and a feast of Floyd. And so that's another one of my philosophies to approach food as art, the art of play, the art of preparation, the art of gathering, the art of making. So how is your philosophy? And so I just have here about social media and I'm just gonna have Rose go through this really fast, but you know, about sharing, how you share your story. So I share my story on Facebook. That is where I like, you know, I also do Instagram um, and, you know, there's Twitter, there is Snapchat, there's TikTok, there's YouTube, there's so many different places, you know, and how I try and we're going to do, we're going to do another workshop at the end of the month called um, Friend Raising is Friend Raising. And I'll talk a little bit more about how you get your story out about friend raising um, is about doing things that are newsworthy you know so I've always thought about when I'm doing something like what is something that is different than someone else because people are more inclined to do that and also what is something that is newsworthy next slide and so people know all about this, this is like from another presentation that for chefs and and farmers that don't do this so I think that a lot of people know how to do this you know so can you go all the way down to basic marketing strategy 55 so um, you have an authentic story to tell convey to your customers why your product is amazing the quality freshness how supporting your business supports the local economy uniqueness personal connection with farmer and their family, you're able to give a customer a real story. This is valuable. And I have lots of stories that I can tell. And I don't know if I said the best stories here because I'm trying to get through information and get people thinking about ways in which I don't, you know, I think the word is overused pivot, but I think that be malleable, be adaptable. You can fit a niche and still be able to do other things and have multiple streams of income within that one niche. Because basically everything that I do, I always say goes back to education. So even if I'm doing social media for someone, I'm educating people because that's marketing is education. Um, if I'm doing an event or when I do these setups, that's all education. Even in behind me, the installation that I'm in, my art installation is education about Oshun, self-love, transformation. So it's education. So understand that. Social listening, what are people saying about you? What are people saying about your competitors? What topics are trending? What conversations are people having? Next, uh, rules of thirds. Um, have people get to know you. How people get to like you 
have people get to trust you. So those are things you're trying to do in social media and in general for your business to get customers. So, you know, I think that, you know, a lot of people understand that I'm an educator, you know, so people come to me in regard to that, in regard to writing, in regard to art, in regard to um, a wellness workshop for their colleagues. People understand that at this, I might do different things in food, but at, at my central, I'm an educator doing education. And I'm just, as my daughter says, a fun educator. Next slide. Um, so we're gonna go all the way to personal chef. So yeah, so we said about a personal chef. Personal chef is a chef who's hired by different clients and prepares meals in clients' homes, kitchens, based on their needs and preferences. You can specialize in special diets. You can specialize in, you know, big families. You can specialize um, in just meal planning or just shopping. You know, there's personal chefs that just do that. You know, a personal chef should do um, five, I think I just call it a five by five. Like five meals, four, okay, yeah, five meals, five different meals, four different servings. And in Connecticut, you can get between 350 and up plus the price of um, ingredients. A private chef gets paid differently because a private chef stays usually only with one person. A personal chef goes from one person to the next and cooks food in their house and leaves it. Food stylist. I have a certificate. Next slide, please. Oh, shoot. I have a certificate in um, food styling from the new school. And I have used it for myself, but then get hired by other people to do prop styling for, um, I'm sorry, I have to plug this in. Um, to do prop style for cookbooks and um, stuff like that. And then also um, for catering and things like that. You know, but a food stylist, for the day gets upper hundreds of dollars to thousands of dollars for the day. Next slide, please. Food writer. Um, so food writers just get paid a lot more money. You know, like Yankee Magazine pays well. Um, you know, a good food writing fee is a dollar per word. Um, and per recipe, a good fee is $250 plus a recipe plus the cost of food. And this is not a food blogger, which is different because a food blogger usually, next slide please, makes their, um, their money through advertising. Um, and like pay promotion and stuff like that. So food event producer or curator. So I got paid to go down to Jamaican Epicure and Escape. And also I've done things um, in Tobago Jazz Festival, Jamaica Jazz Festival. And I've gone around the country and done um, different events or produced different events. And so in this, like for this, I did, I helped them with marketing. They wanted to get people from um, Europe and America, and I also helped them with talent. And so, like a lot of times, I might, you know, work for the Boston Jerk Festival, and I curate talent for them. I'll get all the um, judges and all the chefs, and do all that kind of stuff. So it depends on, you know, who the client is. I might be my own client, where I'll do my own events. Um, so yeah, next slide. So 
with the food events, you can get paid. If I do my events myself, I cut the middleman out. Sometimes I do things with a nonprofit where I'll get a percentage and I'll get the higher percentage because I do the majority of the work, you know, and, but it's a win-win because they don't have the capacity to um, do their regular business and plan an event. So it's a win-win for them to be able to hire me and then they can either give me a fee or usually I'll work with a percentage. Okay, food truck owner. Food truck owner is, um, I, I was hired by Fresh Food Generation. They're still in business, which is great, even through the pandemic. And um, they've been in business probably like five years. And um, this is in Boston. And I was hired to do their menu planning and um, train them to cook on a food truck and to be able to create menu items that be able to you know, work here and all that kind of stuff and how to be able to make a profit. Um, and they asked me to be a uh, part owner and I was for like probably like a year. Um, I never was worked on the truck or anything like that. I just, um, you know, so I'm just showing people different ways in which, you know, you can be an owner and just receive money. You know, you can be part of a restaurant group. You know, you don't have to be the person that is um, cooking and, you know, like being hired as a consultant and then getting part ownership was great, you know, for the time that was there. But food, being a food truck owner, it's, it's very hard. It's like high volume. And yeah. So next slide, please. Culinary educator. And so, um, oh, so food truck makes, um, you know, between 2000, they can make $2,000 in a day. You know, they can make $2,000 in a week. It depends, you know, so it depends and it depends on the laws of where you are. So those are things I want people to think about when you want to start something, because I consulted with a Jamaican food truck. They didn't think about that. You also have to make the food a lot of times on the food truck if you don't have a kitchen, so if you don't have access to a health coded kitchen. So know you're about permit permitting. You know, I had a friend that wanted to open up uh, a bakery, uh, a pasta business and the amount of permitting stuff they had to go through in New Haven, they couldn't even do it after like six months, the amount of money that they spent. So those are things that are really important that you should find out before you start, um, you know, putting money into a business. Uh, so culinary educator, that's what I'm trying to do here. That's what I try and do when I'm teaching people how to cook or, you know, do a culinary tour. All right. Next to the slide. Oh, uh, yeah. We have to take matters into our own hands, not only by advocating for a better diet for everyone, and that's the hard part, but improving our own. And that happens to be quite easy. Less meat, less junk, more plants, it's a simple formula. Eat food, eat real food. We can continue to enjoy our food and we can continue to eat well, and we can eat even better. We can continue the search for the ingredients we love and we can continue to spin yarns about our favorite meals. We'll reduce only not only calories, but our carbon footprint. We can make food more important, not less, and save ourselves by doing so. We have to choose the path. And so just going with my theme and my vision and my mission um, in regard that like Mark, Mark Bittman personifies like what I'm ultimately trying to do. And I, you know, like in regard to Harvest Mandalas is mandalas are circle, mandalas were all interrelated. So in regard to food from seed to waste, that's what I'm trying to engage people in those types of conversations in the programs and programming that I do. Last slide. That is my background. And I studied food in Paris. I didn't mention that, that was really fun. And, you know, like studying farming and all that kind of stuff, it's just, brought in my repertoire. I think that, you know, um, it's important to take cooking classes and for me to learn continually and increase my skills. That's how I brought in my skills and make myself more marketable. And as I said, I've had more than enough work, you know, thank, thankfully, 
um, feeling blessed during this pandemic because I write, because I do so many things behind the scenes. Um, I, as I said, my, my, all my programs, in-person programs were canceled, but I could um, rebound by June by producing videos and writing and writing curriculum and writing proposals for um, art residencies in which I received. I received a whole bunch of art residencies and proposals for funding. And so I will talk about that on the 26th. Next week we have Kay um, from a whole lot of things. She's a hairdresser, she's a crafter. She um, is the founder of the Caribbean um, Association here in New Haven and is a proponent of Caribbean culture and creativity. And so I look forward to um, speaking with her next week and also look out for our last program uh, of Wednesday and that's friend raising is fundraising and it's about like um, raising money. And so talking about how you raise money and not only looking at money as funds, but as um, energy. And then also in regard to like bartering and getting the things that you need, it might not come through a transaction of dollar bills. It might come through doing a favor for one person and getting something for another and so forth. So we're going to talk about all those things. And I will tell some stories there, some interesting stories. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Nadine. Have a nice evening, everyone. Thank you.